Um, I work for SRUC Band Campus. My sort of day-to-day -day job is forestry and arboriculture. The deer side comes in because for the, well, since about 2000, I've been involved in the DSC level ones and twos, teaching that, assessing it, and internally verifying it. Um, I've also helped uh, Davy in his booklet on um, urban deer control. So that's where I stand in this. And he, <coughs> Um, South Lancashire um, Deer Management Group asked me to give a, a short talk on how I see urban deer. Okay, so I want to give a bit of a sort of background as I see it. So I think the first thing is to understand what we have here. So we've got so the deer species in Scotland. We've got red deer, roe deer, fallow deer, and seeker deer. Um, at present, the most commonest one, of course, in urban settings is the roe deer in Scotland. We do know that red deer, they can be um, found in uh, people's gardens, uh, houses, villages, stuff like that. So there is instances of that. Generally in the UK, uh, roe and munjet are the common deer in urban areas. So if we look at the whole picture, OK? Um, if we look at some sort of statistics, in England, the outskirts of Sheffield, there's been about 150 uh, reported sightings of red deer. That was in 2008. And you compare that to 1980, where there was only three. Um, there's a lot of media coverage nowadays on this. Um, you have probably seen it in the press. There was a television program on it. Uh, it's on Facebook. It's in newspapers. Uh, it's not just Roe and Munjak that are invading or coming into uh, urban areas, but fallow deer as well. So these are pictures um, of fallow deer in, I think it's the outskirts of London. Yeah. Um, so we know that these sort of problems are occurring. Okay? So, what I'd like to do is just talk briefly about legislation and how urban deer started to be recognised over the years here, you know, for Scotland, okay? So, the recognition of urban, very urban deer, right? So in Scotland, we have two actions to put the management of deer in Scotland. The first one I was thinking of when I was reading about this was the 1996 Deer Scotland Act, okay? And then the other one was the Wildlife and Natural Environment Scotland Act 2011. So, uh, if we look at the 96 Act, um, it allowed for changes in what was then the Red Deer Commission uh, to that of the Deer Commission for Scotland. It was responsible for conservation, um, control, uh, sustainable deer management, as well as revising all things that were relating to deer. <coughs> the Commission had to understand the size and density of deer populations and their impact on the natural heritage. Uh, also, the needs for agriculture and forestry to be able to prosper um, without considerable damage from deer, uh, from increasing deer populations. Okay. Um, they also had to understand the interest of owners and occupiers of land. Uh, we also had closed seasons for male and female deer and out of season authorizations. That was done on welfare grounds. It also allowed for culling a deer in the interest of public safety. Uh, there was at this time uh, no recognition or mention of urban or peri urban deer, so it wasn't really a big issue at that time. So we then come on to the Wildlife and Natural Environmental Act 2011. Here we recognize a problem of urban deer um, within that sort of 50 year period uh, time. Frame. So it was significant enough to be specifically mentioned in this. Although the Wayne Act um, was needed to modernise outdated laws. One of its aims was to deal with invasive and non-native species. So that could include such things as you know, Munja. It was also to modernise deer management legislation which included recreational stock. In section one of this act, the function of what was the Deer Commission, now part of SNH, is that they are responsible for the conservation of deer native to Scotland. So SNH were responsible for management of deer in relation to public safety, as in the 96 Act. But this was to include deer in areas where they may become a pest, such as, and to quote this, is the need to manage the deer in urban and peri-urban areas. So we started to recognize this problem of urban deer. 
we have within this uh, way that the code of practice on deer management. Okay. So the deer code, how does it pertain to urban deer? Right? Well, it was approved by Scottish Parliament as code of practice. Um, it's saying that all those people who manage land where deer can be found or where, man or where they're managed on someone else's ground. So that's a fairly generic statement that was made. So we want to think how this sort of affects us in urban deer. So the code sets out how land managers can deliver sustainable deer management. Sustainable is a key word there. By this we mean managing and not eradicating them, which, which is important in urban areas because we've got to have our biodiversity. It puts new responsibilities in land managers and helps them identify what they must do. Uh, an example, it informs us on how to apply codes for um, apply the code for various reasons. So, let's take an example, such as managing deer to prevent negative impacts on possibly public health. You know, uh, think of polluted ground. We could have um, fluorides, mercury, heavy metals, ra radioactive substances from polluted land. This can translocate into deer tissue um, and would really create unedible venison. So, you know. These are the sort of things we want to prevent getting into the food chain. Yeah. It stresses managing deer collaboratively. Right? So of take, talking to the neighbor and planning together, i.e. that's both private and public bodies. So uh, it, discloses, it discusses the fact that deer have migrated into new areas and are increasingly seen in and around towns and cities. It also points out that there's a growing concern about potential welfare risks. Right? Now, for example, those could be things like poaching, cruelty, uh, fences, impacts uh, on road safety. Right? It informs us on how to apply the code for various situations. So for an urban scenario, it makes us think of the impact of our management activities, such as a re recreational stalker, for instance. Uh, if you didn't kill enough deer, um, and so creating uh, greater damage to the local environment through grazing. Uh, they would have loss of proper body weight, uh, less ability to withstand adverse weather conditions, and so uh, more perceptible to natural mortality. parts, a uh, quote from it, was to tackle welfare issues as and when they arise for individual deer. So if we look at that in urban context, this, um, for this it may be deer caught in roadside boundary fences, or injured deer through road traffic accidents, or maybe even poaching incidences. Uh, take account of the impact on the welfare of deer in planting, planning decisions relating to the layout and management of public places and immunity planting. So this could be for recreational stock of reducing the deer in the area, so there's a less stress from public interaction with, say, dog walkers, or to prevent damage to proposed immunity planting. Um, okay. <coughs> Highlights in the chapter six that public bodies are required to take into account of this code when carrying out any further any functions which could impact on deer. Right. So, you know, this could be sort of planning, uh, road construction, anything like that. So the increased distribution of deer in and around towns means that public bodies, such as local authorities, should assess the extent to which uh, they must apply the code. Okay. So we then want to take a look at reasons for deer expansion now that we've covered some of the legislation part. Well, we've got land use changes, okay? So the expansion of deer habitat has been brought about by land use changes. It creates better habitat than previously, so you inevitably have expansion. So for instance, we have the establishment of amenity, community, and commercial woodlands, uh, the landscaping of highly visible transport corridors and business sites with plantings in order to sort of hide them. And we've seen those on um, transport corridors, uh, motorways and such like, where there's new plantings going on there. Okay. By community green space projects and improved landscapes. There, <clears throat> these many projects have helped to establish better habitat for the expansion of deer. 
It has also allowed for the migration of deer to areas previously devoid of deer. So those that might be on the periphery have been able to come in because of these new plantings and therefore establish themselves. So such organizations have helped develop this improved habitat have been over the years things like the Central Forestry Scotland, that was from 94 to 2014. It then changed to the Central Scotland Network Trust in 2014. We've then got the Central Scotland Green Networking Partnership in 2009. We've got the Forestry Commission with its WIAT project, which is Woods in and Around Towns. It's 2011 to 2014 phase, uh, is concentrated in the role of urban woods in delivering environmental and economic benefits. Uh, we've then got other organisations like the Woodland Trust, Community Woodland Associations, and so on. So they've all helped to establish woods in and around towns, which created this better habitat for the deer. Um, so what else has helped in the increase of deer numbers? Well, mild winters, climate change, that's helped a lot as well. It's getting a better survival rate, and therefore um, they breed better with more deer about, uh, and better habitat. Changes to agricultural, like the increase in winter crops outside the towns and sort of peri-urban areas. Um, Therefore, again, back to a better survival rate. Um, we've also got greater connectivity between green spaces and urban areas. That's been long standing in planning, where we have sort of like wildlife borders and uh, there's interconnection between little woodlands and such like. Okay. So that allows the deer to sort of migrate all around the place. Um, we've also got the other one, which is the fragmentation of land ownership and absentee landlords. So if you're wanting to do some management on it, this can create a bit of a difficulty. If you can't manage them, of course, your numbers go up. So, you know, it, it doesn't help. Absentee landlords, if you can't uh, contact somebody in order to find out if you can uh, manage the deer there, then again, the same sort of scenario, the same sort of problem. Um, so, um, to look at the positive and negative impacts of urban deer, okay? Um, Lovely little roe deer picture there. Um, the first thing is we're a nation of animal lovers, aren't we? You know, we look at that and it's lovely. We don't, we don't see it from, well, the general public don't see it from the shooting side of things, okay? The public like to see deer, okay? Some species such as the red deer, they're iconic uh, and they feature in such programs as Autumn Watch, uh, which was on the right activity of the red deer run. They even gave each individual stag names, etc., so the public could relate to this in the program. Yeah. Uh, however, the general public don't come into contact with deer very often, uh, mainly because of corruption, in other words, dawn and dusk activity times. Yeah. When it comes to urban deer, the smaller they are, the better. So Roe and Mundrick can adapt very well in urban areas. Um, positive things, they bring a variety of wildlife just by their mere presence. So, you know, like I said, people like that. Um, they can, by grazing, keep vegetation in check, create more open spaces, so preventing the regeneration of trees and things like this. Um, plus, roe deer uh, is part of our natural biodiversity in the area, so it's a positive thing. Um, they can help uh, spread plant seeds, and so doing, recolonize more barren ground, because in the central belt, we have a lot of industrial wasteland and so on. But just as much as you can say it's a positive effect, it could also be a negative effect because there are some plant species which we don't want to spread. Yeah? So um, it could work both ways in that. So with deer in general, the public perception is that they live in forests in the countryside, not really in towns. However, this is being challenged, um, as mentioned by the media and the press articles. So, the negative impacts that we would have on this, uh, one that comes to mind and comes up with the public as well quite often uh, is deer vehicle collisions. Yeah? Um, for urban uh, deer, recent research shows that there's something like 7,000 collisions between motor vehicles and deer every year in Scotland, right? with an average of 65 of them causing human injuries. The combined economic value of these accidents through human injury as well as vehicle damage is estimated. Now, looking at this on the internet, I was coming up with different figures, anything from 7 million to 9.2 million. Either way, it's a lot of money. Yeah? Not, not something I'll get out of my pocket. So. Um, 
if we look at the UK as a whole, there's between 42 and 74,000 deer vehicle related accidents. 44% of these are in urban areas. So that's resulting in 400 to 700 human injuries and about 15 deaths, with an annual cost of about 47 million pounds. So you can see why they've done a little bit of research in it, and there's a lot of concern in that area. <coughs> we then have diseases, um, and deer have the potential to spread and harbor diseases. Right? SNH under the Scottish Wild Deer National Approach. Uh, they are responsible to keep a watch on such diseases as bovine TV, blue tongue, and scientists think that it's going to be more prevalent with climate change. Uh, chronic wasting disease, CWD, uh, which is a big thing in America. I believe that can be spread just through soil and stuff like this. So, you know, there's a, so there's a risk of it happening in Europe and in Britain in particular. Uh, deer are also susceptible to foot and mouth uh, dreams disease, just to mention some of ours. But for people in the urban areas, is, is that tick-borne diseases? That's the one that would really affect them. Okay. Um, not to be a, a scaremonger, but you know, let's think of these things. We've got things like Lyme disease that's gained a lot of publicity in America and in the UK until recently by Bada UK. It's a bacterial infection spread to people by infected ticks. You know? It can affect your skin, joints, heart, and nervous system. If left untreated, it can become chronic Lyme's disease, which is similar to chronic fatigue syndrome. Right? It's also possible for this disease to affect our pets as well. Uh, so this can make it a risk for dog walkers in urban and peri-urban environments. There's also a tick-borne encephalitis, I hope I pronounce it right, which is predicted to become more prevalent in the future years with climate change. The initial stages are flu-like symptoms, but the secondary stages, which can be a lot more serious if it gets to that, uh, requires hospitalization. Uh, and if it gets into this more advanced stage, it's very serious because um, the virus spreads to the brain and the spinal cord, uh, and about one in every hundred causes of TBE is fatal. There was a press uh, release and research by Professor Richard Wall at the University of Bristol. Uh, and they found between three to four hundred ticks in a two-meter patch of grass at Ashton Park Estate, which was a favorite area for dog walkers. Um, this can be seen on Facebook pages in the Bristol Post. Okay? Other concerns, we have environmental habitat damage, numbers become great, greater than carrying capacity, unwanted attention by poachers, guns, booms, deer dogs, creating welfare issues. Damage to people's gardens, woodlands, and public spaces. So this was just a, another piece of uh, press, which was about a compensation scheme costing eight and a half thousand pounds from the council budget, and this is for roses in a cemetery. Yeah? Uh, in the end, they put the rose beds down to grass. It doesn't change the situation. The deer are still there. They can still feed in grass as well as roses. <coughs> so research on urban deer. The Forestry Commission produced a report. This report was written up by the Forestry Commission as Peri Urban Deer. It was done in 2009. Uh, by Peri Urban Deer, we mean the transitional area, which are a mixture of land use, including housing, transport infrastructure, industry, as well as agricultural forestry, and that could be on the fringes of towns and settlements. Okay? The research area is based on the boundary of the Central Scotland Forest Trust, which I mentioned earlier is one of the organizations that helped establish woodlands in our own towns and stuff. The report focused on how to manage deer and people interactions rather than managing the deer themselves. A more proactive role in investigating alternative ways to find solutions than what we customarily do with stalkers. Yeah? The report gave values and met impacts of roe deer in this peri urban environment. So, for example, the most common one was seeing and sharing the local environment with deer. That's what people thought was doing. Further down the scale came cultural food sources, i.e., venison. There was, they thought it was less important. The reason for this was that red deer are seen in the Wild Highlands um, and are iconic and in the north and they hold an economic value for tourism, uh, venison, etc. But we're talking about urban areas and in urban areas it wasn't seen as, a, uh, as important in limited value in this way. Why? Because you've got little public deer interaction. They associate deer with out in the country. The impact that was flagged up 
was the welfare concerns and exposure of the poaching acts of cruelty as well as uh, road traffic accidents, which is not surprising. So the general community did not think that there was enough deer to worry about, and they had little impact upon their lives. Why? Because they're crap so right? So <clears throat> they're very skeptical of the need to manage deer. But the communities and the research realize that deer do not need to be managed. Uh, sorry. They realized that they do need to be managed and supported this in principle. Uh, what they were looking at or thinking of was fencing, bird scares, and such like. Okay? Culling was a last resort, and if it was only done selectively, humanely, and professionally. Interesting enough, they did uh, a question survey with agree or disagree uh, examples of questions, and the two things that came up quite much, or quite a lot, was that they are not allowed to damage their gardens. Yeah? And people can't get economic value via stalking. Yeah? So, what can be done about this? Right. Since the report by the Forestry Commission was done five years ago, <coughs> the numbers have increased, and so is the media coverage. Right. SNH under the Wayne Act will say any personal organization in reaching agreement with third parties to help in the management of deer so they can be referred. Okay. Currently, SNH are working with Transport Scotland. Uh, warning motorists of high risks of deer on roads during May, uh, May by the use of variable message uh, signs on high risk trunk roads. The erection of fencing to prevent deer from crossing roads at deer vehicle collision hotspots and funding them to more safer crossing points. In 2010, there was a conference was held in Warwickshire to work out the best ways to deal with urban deer. Much like our talk today, uh, where we're raising the profile of urban deer here in the central belt. The suggestion of deer passes, similar to landscape flyovers and motorways to reduce motor accidents, is another thing. Uh, investigations into urban deer numbers by the use of thermal imaging to establish population densities for future management plans. And the promotion of best practice guides developed by SNH, one in which focuses actually on urban deer. The development and implementation of the deer code as well competence by deer management sector in achieving the DSC level one and other current awards which is achieved by formal training and assessment have been done. This has been promoted by organizations like the LGNS through uh, some of its deer management groups. As for the future uh, of urban deer, I think we need to educate the public on the extent of their expansion um, <clears throat> and the various methods which are effective in managing them and are financially feasible. 